Great. Jeff, why don't you start us off? All righty. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm Jeff Simmering with the Council of Great City Schools, and I want to thank you all uh, um, for joining us today on this uh, extremely important topic of the 2020 census count. Uh, we have actually had over uh, 100 people registered, so I think some people will probably be joining us in progress. Um, I want to extend uh, our gratitude to uh, Deborah Stein with the Partnership for America Children and uh, Victoria Glazier uh, with the Statistics and Schools Branch of the U.S. Census Bureau for presenting this webinar for us. Um, urban areas in particular have been concerned actually for decades about being undercounted with undercounting uh, associated with a variety of factors, be it uh, large households, uh, kids living with grandparents, uh, kids living with a single parent, um, immigrants, poverty, low educational uh, levels, uh, unemployment, all are factors, or mobility, all are factors in, uh, in the undercount in urban areas uh, over the decades. And whether or not the citizenship question that is currently under Supreme Court review will be included on the 2020 survey, one way or the other, getting a full and accurate census count in each one of our urban jurisdictions is extremely important in determining congressional representation in the House of Representatives, um, as well as over three quarters of a trillion dollars in federal aid allocated in some manner based on the census count, including our key pro education programs of Title I and IDEA grants, were, which are uh, among the 10 largest federal aid programs that are linked in some fashion to the census count. So I would again uh, thank uh, Deb and Vicki uh, for, um, for presenting in this, in this uh, webinar, and I will turn it over to you two uh, again with much thanks. Thank you, Jeff. So as um, Jeff said, I'm Debbie Stein with the Partnership for America's Children. We are part of the leadership team of a national initiative called Count All Kids, um, dedicated to trying to count every young child in the 2020 census. And if you take away just four things um, from today's webinar, the things that we would really like you to be aware of are that the number of young children missed in the decennial census is very large, it's growing, and the consequences are serious. Young children are missed for different reasons than adults, and that means we need to count them differently. There's a big national effort with advocates um, that are working at the national level, in states, and in localities to improve the count of young children. And schools can play a significant role in helping count young children. Um, I can see that some people are having some trouble uh, hearing me. I've tried to turn up the sound. Uh, let me, is that any better? Um, Okay, let's hope that that's working for people. Um, the things that you need to know for young children is that being counted really helps young children thrive. And it does so in a number of ways. First of all, as Jeff mentioned, it improves their political representation for their communities, not only um, at the federal level by affecting representation in the House of Representatives, but also in states legislatures, in county legislatures, and in many cases in school board districts, depending on how your school board is um, allocated. The second way that it matters is that it actually creates more funding for a number of school programs which are funded through a formula. The five biggest ones where that's true are Medicaid, CHIP, foster care, adoption assistance, and child care. And because of an undercount in 2010 for young children, states actually lost more than half a billion dollars a year from just these programs. If we can count all the kids in 2020, we'll actually have more money coming into the states to support all these programs. But even when um, the total amount of federal dollars is allocated by Congress or appropriated by Congress, the census data often matters in allocating the funding. 
So if we count all kids in your communities, we end up with a more equitable distribution of funds. That's true for um, Title I, for IDEA special education. It's also true for a different part of the child care funding. It's true for Head Start expansion funds. And it's true for a number of other kinds of programs that benefit your communities and the families that live in them. Even when uh, the data is being used for other purposes and not for allocating funding, it makes a big difference. And one of the biggest, of course, for you is that it helps you uh, know what size your incoming classes will be and how many uh, classrooms you need, how many chairs in those classrooms. It often affects the resources available to health facilities. It can even make a big difference to private enterprise, and that can even matter for families. So one example for that would be Many of the um, big cities have areas with food deserts where there's no good um, grocery store that lets families buy fresh produce and food. Well, private enterprise decides whether to go into those communities based on the market they think is there, and that market um, is determined in part using census data. So if you don't, if you have an undercount in your community, they're going to think that their business can't make it there when, in fact, maybe it could. Um, it also gives us data and information on child well-being. Um, the National Kids Count Report, which is produced by the Casey Foundation nationally and in all 50 states, for si 10 of its 16 indicators of child well-being come from census data. The other thing to keep in mind is that any undercount of young children affects all census data for a decade or most of a child's lifetime. What do I mean by that? Well, the census is the only time when the Census Bureau actually tries to count everybody. Everything else they do is a survey. And in a survey, they go into each community and sample a certain number of people to answer questions. How many people they sample in each community is based on their belief, their knowledge about how many people are in their community. And that comes from the census data or from estimates from it. So when we undercount a community in a decennial census, that community then gets undercounted and unrepresented in every survey the Census Bureau does for a decade. So I said before that the census undercount of young children is large and growing. What exactly did I mean? In 2010, we missed one in 10 young children, ages zero to four. And there's two ways that we count this. One is just the number of kids that were missed, which is omissions. That's where we missed 2.2 million young children. We also look at whether the total count of children was right, and we do that by um, taking the number of children missed or omitted and subtracting for it the number of children that got counted twice or in other ways shouldn't have been counted. Perhaps they were born after the census date. Um, once you get subtract out those children, the net number of the undercount, the, whether the count was accurate at that particular level, um, we, we had a net um, national undercount of young children of just under 1 million children. Um, and so either way you look at it, those are really big numbers. Um, you'll see throughout this presentation that I talk about the net undercount at state levels. Um, and I will uh, you know, talk you through that, but that's because below the national level we don't have omission numbers. I should explain that we calculate how many children were missed by comparing census data to birth and death records and immigration data. So this number of how many children were missed actually is a Census Bureau number. You, if you take all the number of children that were born, subtract the number of children that were died, that died, and then add in um, the number of children that immigrated into the country and compare it to the decennial census, you can see that we actually missed 2.2 million children. There's, that's pretty uncontroversial. Everybody agrees that that's what happened in the 2010 census. Um, young children were by far the biggest group missed in the 2010 census, so that they had a higher net undercount than any other five-year age group. The next highest age group that was missed was the five to nine-year-olds. Um, some age groups, as you can see, as you look across the chart, actually had pretty significant overcounts. But our group was the biggest group that was missed um, among age groups. It also was the total number 
missed that was highest. There's a couple of other groups, young Hispanic men, young black men, where they were missed at a higher rate, but even there they missed many fewer people total because um, those groups are smaller. Um, it's not going to surprise you to know that the kids that were missed are disproportionately kids of color. The highest uh, rate that was missed was young Hispanic kids at 7.5%. Um, we missed over 6% of black children, but you'll notice that even white kids, we missed almost 3%. So even young white children got missed at a significant rate. Um, it's also, and this is going to matter particularly for you, the bigger the county, the higher the rate at which kids are missed. So in very small counties, we actually overcount kids. Um, in counties from 20 to 50,000 people, we miss just over 1% net of young children. By the time you get to uh, counties that are between 100,000 and 250,000, we miss over 2.3% of young children. Um, and by the time you get to counties of half a million or more, we miss almost 8% of young children. So for your constituencies, the rate of num young children that are missed is even higher than the national average. This undercount is not new. It has been growing for 40 years. Up until 1980, the number of young children that were missed has been about the same as the number of adults. But starting in 1980, the Census Bureau got better and better at counting adults, but at the same time, um, the number of young children that got counted, um, that they, that got worse and worse, and they were missing more and more young children. So if we don't do something about this now, that is like that trend is likely to continue. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your communities in general, in particular. As I pointed out already, larger counties are at a higher risk of a young child undercount. We also know that counties that are growing faster seem to be at a higher risk of an undercount. And then for um, partly because of the potential for having a citizenship question on the census form, but also just in general because of the current climate of fear for immigrant communities, um, we know that cities that have a high level of immigrants are going to face an additional challenge because immigrants, documented or undocumented, are so afraid of what might be coming next down the pike that they are particularly uh, reluctant to fill out the census. So why do we miss young children in the census? Why would that age group be missed more than any other age group? Whoops. Um, one of the biggest reasons seems to be family structure. What we know is that two out of the three children we missed lived in complex households. Uh, so a complex household could be a multi-generational household, it could be extended families, it could be multi-family households that are not even related to each other. You know, it could be grandma, parent, child. It could be an aunt and uncle who are raising their own kids and their nieces and nephews. It could be a friend of the family who is homeless and she and her child are living on the couch um, and doubling up. Maybe they're paying rent, maybe they're not, until uh, she can afford to find an, an, her own apartment and move out. Um, any kind of complex household seems to make ch young children more at risk of being not counted. We know that in 2010, of the children that were missed, only 16% lived in a household that wasn't counted at all. So four out of five of the kids live in a household that was counted, but the young child was left off. Um, another 15% were the only person that was left off, and in most cases, children were missed along with some other member of the household. They're also much more likely to be missed when the person filling out the form is not their biological or adoptive parent. Um, parents are more likely to include their child than other adults in the household. The second big reason that we think that children may be missed in the census is fear and confusion. In some cases, people don't want to report their child to the government. There's a general distrust of the government, which we know has grown substantially even since 2010. Um, the, the families which have immigrant undocumented uh, members are, of course, going to be very concerned about their records being kept confidential and about people finding out that they have someone who is not documented. And, well, nearly all young children are citizens because they're born here. Almost 2 million young children um, 
live with at least one undocumented parent, which means the addition of a citizenship question is going to mean not only that that undocumented parent doesn't get counted, but probably in most cases that the entire household won't. There are other yet reasons why people are afraid to include their young child. Um, a big one is that they live in a restricted housing unit or they have many more people in the household than the landlord knows about, and they're afraid that the landlord will learn and that they'll get evicted. There's also some reason to believe that this, people think the Census Bureau doesn't want children included in the census. 15% um, of people in a Naleo study, so they were surveying Hispanic families, said they would not include their young child or didn't know if they would. We did our own message research and asked why people might leave their young children off. And they basically said, well, you know, why do they need it? They're not going to school. They're not paying taxes. They don't need to know about the young child. Um, I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of why people don't report their young child. We need more research on it. But what we know is that in some cases they just don't believe they should. Um, another big reason about why young children are left off is that the same things that make adults harder to count can be true of young children, and more young children fit into those categories. So, for example, it's harder to count households where the person filling out the form, the householder, is a young adult, age 18 to 29. Well, young children are very likely to live in a household where the householder is age 18 to 29. People who live in rental units are harder to count, or multi-structure units, and young children are more likely to live in that kind of unit. Um, people who moved in the last year are harder to count. Young children are more likely to have moved. All of these things make anyone harder to count, but it, they are more likely to be true of young children. So the one other thing that we are learning about why children are missed and how to find them is that um, we've um, a colleague organization the Population Reference Bureau, and Dr. Bill O'Hare, who is the nationally recognized expert on the undercount of young children, are doing research to identify areas with lots of kids that were missed back in the 2010 census, and they found four factors that identify the communities where kids are particularly likely to be missed. One is having a high percentage of racial and ethnic minorities. One is a high percentage of households that are linguistically isolated. One is a percentage of young children who are living with grandparent householders. And the final is young children living with non-relative householders or in group quarters. That doesn't mean that the child has no family with them. What it means is the child is not related to the person filling out the form. So if a young child is living with their mother and their mother's boyfriend and their boy mother's boyfriend fills out the form, that child is living with a non-relative householder. If um, the person filling out the form has a, a next door, you know, has a neighbor living with them temporarily because she lost her own home and she has her children there, that child is living with their mother, but they're also living with a non-relative householder, and that's the person filling out the form. So we think that probably is largely um, cohabiting families or couch surfing, doubled up families in those cases. That gives us a pretty good idea of which families are more likely not to get counted, or at least things to look for. What are we doing to try and count all of all kids? What is the National Count All Kids um, effort? We actually have two related pieces. One is our Count All Kids Committee, and the other is our Count All Kids Campaign. Um, and both efforts are rely on this kind of analysis of why children are missed. What we believe is that young children are missed for different reasons than adults. And we believe that because most adults seem to be missed because they don't return the form, but young children are primarily missed because the form gets returned and the kids are missed off, left off. So that's obviously a different problem. It means that we need to count young children differently than we count adults. Um, in order to capture the people who don't return the form, the Census Bureau identifies areas that had low census response rates in the last decennial census, and they target those areas. And their message research is driven by figuring out why people don't return the form and what messages will persuade them to return the form. Young children are usually missed when they're left off the form. So first of all, that means they don't necessarily live in communities that have low response rates. They may live somewhere else. 
and it means that we need messages that are not just about returning the form, but about who to count when you return the form. What messages work to get children counted, and how do we get the non-parents, the person filling out the form who is not the parent of the child, to make sure they include the young child. So the Count All Kids initiative is developing a score, a tool, to identify the areas where many young children may be missed. Um, I mentioned before the research in terms of identifying the factors. They are now putting together data that will show for every census tract in the country um, where young kids are likely to be missed and why. And that is going to get built into a website called the Hard to Count Map, um, at, which is run by um, the City University of New York. Uh, and you can find it just by Googling Hard to Count Map. The Census Bureau also has a map called ROAM, R-O-A-M, and they, I understand, are also going to try and put in indicators that will help identify where young kids are at risk of being missed. Secondly, the Count All Kids um, initiative is uh, develop, doing message research to identify the messages that will persuade families to count young children, particularly in complex families. And once we've done that, we're going to develop outreach materials that you'll be able to pull down from our website that are based on that message research and should help persuade families to count their young children. So I said we have two pieces. The first is the National Count All Kids Committee. It's a national complete count committee for young children. It's made of, at this point, I think we have something like 75 national organizations in it that work in different ways with young children. And we're working with the Census Bureau to help them improve their strategies um, around counting ki children. We do brainstormings with them, for example, and to connect them with key partners that they want to work with. We're also coordinating national awareness efforts around this issue and generally trying to engage national networks that work with families of young children so that those networks can have their state and local affiliates um, conduct outreach in 2020. The second piece of our effort is the Count All Kids campaign, and that's really focused on states and localities. Um, we are supporting state and local advocacy efforts to form complete count committees. And those are committees which may be governmental agencies or not, which are basically doing uh, public education and outreach around the census to get people to respond to the census questionnaire. So we're supporting advocates that are trying to get those formed and include a priority on counting young children. We're also supporting efforts once they're formed to help those committees build effective plans for um, counting young children. And we're going to connect them with that tool I mentioned to identify the areas where kids might be missed. And we also hope that they will look at and use our outreach materials based on our method research. Finally, quite apart from complete count committees, um, the Count All Kids Initiative is working with a lot of these national networks of providers, child care providers, pediatricians, libraries, lots of kinds of organizations that work with young children to try and get them to use our outreach materials with families with young children. So yeah, this is um, kind of the whole Count All Kids initiative together, both the national piece and the state and local. So who should be engaged in direct outreach to families? Well, it probably won't surprise you that schools should be um, engaged in direct outreach to families. And uh, Vicki, in a few moments, will talk about some of the tools the Bureau will give you to do that. Child care centers, and of course many of your schools have child care centers sitted in them. Um, others that also are, are valuable to work with are faith communities, medical providers, some government agencies, services such as WIC, libraries, businesses, but you can also get really creative and reach out to anybody in your community that you think can help educate families with young children about the need to count their kids. So what can schools and school boards do to prepare for, in, for the census in 2019? A really big piece is pushing for your city to form a complete count committee um, and to fund it and to make sure young children are top priority. Once it's formed, you want to either sit on that kind of committee or advise it. Um, 
educate them about the kinds of things I'm talking about in this webinar, help them draft plans that target the areas, the census tracts in your city with young children that are most at risk of being missed, um, help them use the materials that we're developing as part of their outreach plans. You can also prepare to use the statistics in schools materials from the Census Bureau, which Vicki will talk about, and then you really want to watch for those materials, which the Bureau will be releasing at the start of the school year. Then in 2020, you can actually use all of the materials that I've been talking about for outreach to families. Um, you can host community events explaining how the Census brings federal funds to your community and your school district and answer questions. There will be toolkits available for this. I believe the Bureau itself will have some kinds of toolkits available and will be producing them as well. You can try and address language differences in com your community. After all, you know probably better than anyone else in your community how many different um, groups of people that speak you know, languages other than English exist because you're teaching their kids. And you can try and provide translation services or identify volunteers who can help do that kind of uh, translation. You can also suggest they respond by phone. There's 12 languages, which I cannot rattle off, um, where people can actually call and the person who picks up the phone will speak in their language and they can fill out the census just by talking on the phone to someone in their own language. This is the first census ever where people are being asked to respond by internet, um, where everybody has that opportunity. And in fact, the first invitations to respond will come to households saying, you know, go online and here's how you fill it out online. Um, so you might want to work on making sure that the families in your school district have internet access. Maybe when they pick up their kids, there'll be a computer where they can take 10 minutes and fill out the form. Um, people will also have the option of waiting for to get a paper form in the mail or for calling in their answers by phone. So you can help people understand that they can answer the census in whatever way they are most comfortable with. Finally, a lot of your school systems have those phone alerts where you can send out a recorded phone call um, to all of your parents. You might want to think about whether that's something you could appropriately use to update people about census problems, um, to let them know how to get, you know, if the website has an issue, for example, to let people know how to get counted, to let them know if there's going to be um, a mobile outreach. I'm forgetting the term, but the census is going to have um, staff that go from location to location to help people with the census. If you've got uh, one of those groups in your community, you might want to use your phone system to let people know about it. And you might want to send out a message to everybody on April 1st, Census Day, to say, you know, this is the Census Day. Make sure that you um, count everybody in your census form who is in your home on that date. Um, so I've given you a list of resources. I see that someone asked if the slides will be via be available after the presentation. And yes, we'll send out a recording of the webinar and the slides to everyone so you can go back and look at this list of resources. The other way you can get information from me is by emailing me at census at countallkids.org and we'll be happy to answer questions um, about counting young kids. But since you are, after all, schools, and one of the biggest and most important things you can do is get information out through the schools. I'm now going to turn this presentation over to Vicki Glazier, and she's going to talk about uh, the statistics in schools program and the materials that will be coming to you that you might want to use. Vicki? Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for calling in. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little about the Census Bureau Statistics in Schools program and what we have planned for 2020 to help get the word out about the importance of filling out the form. Uh, a little teeny background is we have always had an outreach program around the census in the schools, or we have not always, since 1950. We officially became a bigger program called Census in Schools in 2000 and 2010, with the whole goal being providing uh, educators materials about the census to help them communicate this message to the importance to the families and to the students. After 
2010, we became statistics in schools. We worked to turn our census and school program into an ongoing program so that we could be consistent and reliable for the educational community. Our goals are increasing statistical literacy skills. We want to teach about the importance of the census, show the teachers and the students that we have real life data that can be used just to, to get in the minds of the kids that they know the data is there, that it's important and where it came from. It's a free program for K to 12 teachers. We have resources and activities every month to talk about census data. And I'm especially excited that we're going to be adding a pre-K program for 2020 that I will tell you a little bit more about as I talk about the 2020 program. So just a background of what we are right now before we offer the 2020 materials. We worked with teachers and subject matter experts to develop the content that we currently have on our site. Uh, an example of some of the organizations that we've worked with include the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, Women in Mathematics, but we don't, we definitely do not want people to think we're just math. We've tried really hard to even provide resources for elementary school uh, and, and bring the data to a more fun level. Um, so I'm going to run you through what we have now, just to hopefully give you a better idea of what we offer. So we have five subjects. English is our first one, and here's an example of different levels, what we offer. We aim to supplement what is already being taught in the classroom. We're not trying to take over the curriculum, we just figure teachers, we know a lot of teachers uh, teach to kill a mockingbird. So we go in and we provide supplementary, supplementary information where we show you what life was like through uh, economic data and other information in 1933 to 1935. We have state facts for students for middle, middle and elementary school that I will talk about more in a few minutes. Just taking a deep dive to show you further for English, this is a high school activity that talks about uh, young adults and who's living at home and how has that changed. And, and we take kids through it and, and have them read technical information and then develop brochures or have class discussions. And you know, this clearly shows that more young adults are living at home in between 2005 and 2015. So it also goes, this particular activity goes a little more into who is at home. Like let's break down by race and, and whether they're married and, and what's happening there. So on to our second subject, which is history activities. And again, a few examples of activities that we offer through each level. Um, primary source, we have a lot of information for that for those, the kids that do history fair or need more information, they can go back and find census forms, of, or not forms, but census data throughout the years. So a deep dive into history is the history of the telephone. This one is geared towards elementary. Uh, it walks through the evolution of the telephone with one of the first phones started by Alexander Graham Bell. So then they will look at a chart, just to kind of interesting to see on a simple level, like how landline use has changed and the decline that started to happen around 2011. Some of these kids have never even seen a landline phone. Um, our third subject, math. Again, I'll talk about the state facts for students that we have for elementary and middle, but uh, everything from earnings and educational attainment and creating box plots, creating uh, scatter plots, high school. Let's look at some of the data about marriage and divorce and use that in math class. So an example of math would be differences in earnings across sex and educational attainment. This is a high school activity. Students will look at the data and create box plots. This shows the difference in earnings between men and women whose highest level is the high school diploma. 
They will also look at another chart which shows the difference if, between men and women with a bachelor's degree. So we're on to our next, which is sociology. We just have these for high school. Uh, and those subjects including modern family and how has that changed over the years. A look at immigration, a look at poverty in America, just topics that are relevant and we provide the data in a format that hopefully is easily digestible and, and interesting to students. So I pulled out an example of a sociology activity where they talk about the millennial generation and do some comparing, which I find these numbers fascinating. I don't know, I have a high schooler and I'm always telling her these things, just so we know, but you know, young, young adults are more foreign born. They're more likely to never have been in the armed services and they're more likely to have never been married from past generations. So finally, we'll talk about our geography activities. We have a couple cool ones here. Where the one is this elementary middle school one where kids go on a scavenger hunt and they're trying to find a geographer named Gina and we have a data tool where they'll have to answer questions. And an example of the question is like, which state had only one ice cream? maker in it. So with these clues, they'll learn some interesting facts at their level, like how many dentists, how many toy stores, and then they can slowly cross off states to figure out where Gina is located. So an example of geography activities is we show students pictures of Niagara Falls, Times Square, Laguna Beach, and just see how they've changed. And then look at the data that goes with the picture of this is what it was on the left and this is what it is, and let's look at the data and, and talk about some of the reasons that um, this area has changed. Let's look at the population and businesses and houses. So that's a quick run through the actual subjects we have. We also produce a number of resources. We have a monthly fun facts. We have warm-up activities for teachers who just have a minute and want to maybe look at data on a map or, or fill a few minutes while the bell is getting ready to ring. We have videos that are meant for students that kind of hopefully show them why data is everywhere and it can be very cool for them. So I spoke a little bit about the state facts for students, and here is an example. They can look at their state. They can see how many kids their age. They can talk about how people get to work. This is one of our most popular resources because we know that the kids in the lower levels have to learn about their state. So they can do here and, and do geography and math and uh, historical comparison about where they live. An example of our fun facts, we, we put one out every month. We're trying to, we work with our, our subject matter experts at the Census Bureau to, to make the numbers a little more digestible. But uh, here's an example of St. Patrick's Day. We'll be putting out Father's Day soon. It comes with a teaching guide that gives teachers at all levels different ideas for maybe how they can take a number or two and use it in the classroom before these special days. Again, the five-minute challenges. We're, we're right now creating a place on our website that will house information on Constitution Day because we know, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback that teachers use these resources and, and they need to teach about it. So we have a couple five-minute challenges that have students look at the number of representatives in their state and, and how that's changed and just talk about the importance of the census and the Constitution. So we have been, we launched about two years ago, and we have been working really hard with a number of partners to get the word out about the resources that we currently have and the resources that we're going to have for Census 2020. Uh, we, an example, we've done webinars with Share My Lesson. We have a magazine issued being devoted to Census in the geography teacher. We have articles in middle level education We've done webinars for social studies. So we're really trying to, to let all levels and all subjects know the importance. I 
wanted to share with you a few key messages. When we talk about our program, we talk about these key messages. So in today's world, there's a need for knowledge of statistics, and it needs to start earlier. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that statistics-related jobs is going to increase 30% by 2024. Statistics courses are often offered only as electives and not until high school. So we're trying to help bridge that gap. These activities were created with experts from the Census Bureau and by teachers. And in the end, it's a product of the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, we, we had done some focus groups with teachers, and they came back. That, you know, a lot of times they just Google. They need a number, they Google, but they do realize that, that the numbers that come from us you know, are valuable and that they trust them. So I've already talked about our goals, but in using this Evergreen Statistics in Schools program, we're hoping that through the years, more students become educated about what we do and the importance of data, and that one beautiful day when the census comes, they'll, they'll have a much better understanding having had this taught to them in school. So on to what is next for statistics in schools. Here is a roadmap that I'll talk about in more detail about what we are developing for 2020. We're asking that you can start now, visit our website, let your teachers know that this is there and it's a valuable resource. So again, it's just kind of a roadmap. We are currently working on new material development. We're creating a bunch of worksheets and activities that we'll talk about diversity in my community and why the census is important. We're adding a pre-K program. We will have an activity coloring book. We will have songs. We will have videos. There will be a lot of resources on our website for teachers to choose from. We will be posting these activities on our website late September of this year. We will be sending a packet to every single school and superintendent in the United States, Puerto Rico, and the island areas, and those will go out at the end of September. We will have a bunch of other resources that help teachers know how to use these activities in the classroom. And we will have a week in the first week of March where we really try to bring the whole country together with a hoopla, special events to promote the use of census materials in the classroom. So in 2010, over 30% of parents reported seeing census and schools content, which is exciting to us because this time around we've learned and we're, we're conducting a wider outreach campaign. So parents should be seeing this information in multiple places. They should be seeing information from their pediatrician. They should be seeing information at school. They should be seeing information on TV. We, we will be reaching them in many ways, so I will expect this number to increase in 2020. Okay. So Deb already kind of mentioned the importance of having a complete count and the school, the, the things that affect schools special education, school lunches, Head Start, like let's get, let's get a complete count so over the next 10 years you have the resources that you need. What you can do now, encourage teachers to use our resources. Go to this website that is listed here and have them sign up because the message right now is starting to turn to 2020 and to let teachers know what is coming and how can you use it. So signing up now will kind of keep you one step ahead of what is coming in a timely manner. How can you help? You can partner with us. You can make sure everybody that needs to know that these materials are coming and that there will be tubes coming at the end of September to the principals and superintendents. You can help us communicate these messages through email blasts and robocalls. You can really encourage school participation in Statistics in Schools Week. Have families take home the materials that we'll be sending there's, there's a lot of innovative things going on. I, I don't have all the details, but Deb and I are working with a system in Kentucky that is having a contest for using statistics in schools materials and being innovative for Constitution Day in September. 
that pretty much wraps up uh, what I wanted to say today. Here's some contact information if you would like to contact me or need additional information. Thank you. So Jeff, we've got about eight questions. Why don't you uh, tell us which ones you want answered and who you'd like to answer them? Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me start real quickly, uh, Vicki, if, uh, if you would answer one, que one of the questions. Uh, the uh, issue was raised about the citizenship question, which is now in front of the Supreme Court. Um, the question was, if the citizenship question is included on the 2020 um, census survey, what happens if, um, uh, if an individual fills out the rest of the form but leaves that particular question blank? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Deb might have something to say too. So we really want to get the message across that every response is counted, whether the form is completed or not, and that it's confidential and that it matters. So there, there is a possibility by that leaving questions blank will increase the likelihood that we could follow up, but that doesn't mean that we will. We just want to know everybody will be counted and to fill out the questions the best you can, having faith that, that it is confidential. And I think one thing we should make clear is when, the, when Vicki and people from the Bureau say that the information is confidential, um, that's not just a policy. There is a statute on the books that says if you release any individual information that's identifiable from the census, you can be punished with up to five years in jail or up to a quarter of a million dollar fine, which is vastly higher than any other confidentiality protection I've ever heard of. So there's you know, some real reason to have confidence that if you fill out that question, it's not going to be shared. Um, and I think it's important for people to understand that. And the last time I asked um, someone high up in the Bureau whether they'd ever heard of anybody releasing individual census information, uh, their answer was no. I mean, that's a pretty big threat to have hanging over you, and the incentive to release it is non-existent. So, you know, I understand why people would have concerns about filling out the citizenship question um, or filling out the census, but uh, they should know that the protections for confidentiality are high. Um, they, you should also know that the Supreme Court is expected to rule by the end of June on whether the question will be on the form, but there's also currently an effort in Congress to ban the question, and that will play out later this year because it's part of the appropriations bill. So even if the Supreme Court says that the question can stay on, it, it might come off later. Um, I think another question that's somewhat related here is what are the key dates for when the census survey uh, is going to be available, uh, will be mailed or sent um, to households and, uh, and the kinds of deadlines so our schools can begin to uh, um, put together a, a, a timeline or framework of activities over the, over the next year uh, based around those key, the key drop dead dates. So, so I guess we can both pipe in. So I, the, uh, you can start answering in March. They, we reference April 1st as Census Day because that's kind of like what will you be doing on April 1st. But um, it will be online in March. I can get a timeline that lists a bunch of key dates and provide it to you, Jeff, if you would be able to to maybe send it out or post it? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, online, but basically you're saying uh, the expectation is it will be up and online in, in March, and, uh, um, uh, and the, the, the key date, I guess, for, uh, for publicizing it um, is, uh, is the beginning of April. Um, yeah, we, we, it's called Census so, Day, April 1st. But go ahead, Deb, sorry. I was going to say, I think we're going to start publicizing it in January and maybe even earlier for some hard-to-count groups. The importance of April 1st is that you're supposed to count everybody who resides in your household 
but April 1st is the reference day. So if there's someone who is temporarily in your household but won't doesn't have a permanent address and they're in your house on April 1st, you should count them. And, you know, if you have someone who splits their time evenly between two households, um, you know, if they spend more, like a ch- I saw a question about joint custody or kids spending time in more than one household. If a child spends five days a week in one household and two in another, they should be counted in the household where they spend five days a week. But if they split their time evenly, they should be counted in the household um, they were in on April 1st. That's the reference day for who to count. The other thing is that as soon as the forms start getting mailed out in March, people can go online and fill out the survey, but they can also do it after April 1st. Starting in May, and Vicki's timeline that she'll share with you will have the exact date, but sometime in May they start their non-response follow-up operation where they start calling people and going out to their houses if they didn't fill out the form. Even after that, though, people can still go online and fill it out or call up and fill it out or send in a paper form. Um, You know, the start of the census following up with people doesn't stop people from filling it out. And again, Vicki's timeline will probably make it clearer, but the process actually of counting actually goes through June or July. Um, uh, Another another question with regard to um, the online uh, version of the survey. Um, uh, um, Obviously, um, a lot of, in, in a lot of our communities, um, uh, internet access is uh, is not as available as it may be in other communities. Um, for the schools to set up um, uh, internet access um, in general, or for purposes of uh, um, uh, of filling out the census form, um, is. Will people have to come in with, a, you know, an ID or something to to trigger their own uh, uh, to be able to to um, access uh, the, their own census form? If, for example, they did it in a computer lab in one of our schools, and will there be any um, any set of instructions that we might be able to give our school districts? that could, we could provide to our uh, individual schools, principals, um, uh, you know, uh, tech people in our school systems that could uh, be helpful in having uh, members of our community be able to use the internet and, uh, and access it through our school? So that's a great question. I don't know if Deb has more. I know that, that we you will get a, a card in the mail. I know there's a way you can log in and put in your address, but I apologize for not having all the details on that, but I can definitely get it for you. So let me add to that. Um, you don't have to – every form that goes to a household will have a unique identifier, but if you go into the school and use the school computer room – to fill out the census, you don't need that unique identifier with you. There's a non-ID response way to do it. Um, I don't know if the Bureau is currently planning a form for people who are providing that kind of Internet access, but we just, remember I said that our group is working with the Bureau. We just had a brainstorming session with them, and we agreed that they would give us a list of the documents they're producing and then if we see gaps, we'll fill them in so that you won't get two documents addressing the same thing and then not a, you know, one that doesn't. There will absolutely, and I don't know if it will be a Census Bureau document or a document that I produce, but the Bureau confirms is correct. There will be a document for people who are helping other people fill out the forms, and it will include instructions on how to do it at a computer that is not at the person's home when they don't have their ID number. Ah, okay, that uh, I think that would would be uh, uh, extremely helpful. Um, another question for Vicky: um, uh, Some folks ask, are there uh, are there activities or materials uh, that uh, are uh, available for either English language learners in you know in particular languages, or uh, potentially for adult learners? Because we have a number of uh, adult education programs that our school districts uh, um, uh, run. 
There will be. There definitely will be. So our materials will be in English. They will be in Spanish for Puerto Rico. They will be in English and Spanish for pre-K, and we are definitely having an ESL program, an ELL program, in addition to the pre-K that we're adding for 2020. So all of that will be available on our website at the end of August. Okay, great, great. Um, is there other Yeah, uh, uh, Vicki, when you, we know part of the Supreme Court urgency is that the printing of the forms has to happen basically starting this summer. Uh, there was one question about, have you guys looked into the layout of the questions and what order you do the questions in order to make sure that young children get counted, such as maybe putting the children question first? So I think Deb can speak to any research on that kind of thing. I do know that there's been a lot of studies and the form is pretty much set. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe, you know, Deb, if we've researched the order of the questions or that kind of thing for young children. We did not, but one of the things that the Bureau has done this year, which I believe um, I would have liked to have seen it tested, but they didn't have a chance to do that. But um, they're doing it, and I do believe it will help, is that there's prompts on the form. So you start the form by listing how many people are in your household, and then you fill out information about each person, and I think this is the right order. Then it's, it asks you, did you include all, and it used to just say all people, and now it says all adults, children, and babies. And then it gives you a list of adults, children, and babies that you might not have included and asks you who they are. So there's different prompts at different places this year where they specifically highlight that you're supposed to include children and babies where they didn't exist before. That form is set. It's like, as I understand it, it is ready to go to the printer and it cannot be changed. Um, and the only question is, do they leave the citizenship question on or they take it off? And I actually think the citizenship question is the very last question. Um, I, there, but there are also materials online to help people fill out the questionnaire, and that has additional prompts. And then the Bureau, um, I have not yet seen exactly what these materials look like, but it's my understanding that for the first time, they are training the enumerators, those are the people that go knock on doors, um, about making sure that all children are counted, and they are doing special trainings for the people who will take calls at the phone centers and have people fill out the census over the phone to make sure that um, all children are counted. So the operations side, you know, the people who actually draft the questionnaire and get it printed and staff the, you know, phone banks and so forth have included information about children um, in a number of places. Okay, um, uh, we've got a couple of questions and, uh, and we, will, we will respond to those. Um, uh, people have asked for the, uh, uh, with regard to the, the confidentiality provisions in the statute, which we'll, which we'll copy and get out. Uh, I know that a number of our school districts have have also done some resolutions on uh, on census uh, participation, so we'll provide some of those and um, uh, for districts that uh, are considering doing that. Um, we get we did get another question um, uh, with regard to um, whether um, mobile phone devices um, um, uh, versus computer access. Uh, will be available in order to fill out the census forms. Um, I don't oh, know if that you... one. Def um, yes, definitely, definitely yes. So okay. there will not be an app because an app presents security yeah. problems, but they are testing the form to make sure that it is what's called responsive, mobile. which means that you can fill it out from your mobile phone. And I know this because I actually gave them a long list of mobile phones and browsers that with the market share of how they were used to make, you know, help them identify all the things that they need to test. So yes, it should be. 
Okay, another, qu another question was asked of, of how do you deal with families in shelters? So that gets counted by a different process where the administrator in the shelter counts them, and that's called uh, group quarters. And that, that also applies, for example, to people in, um, like children in group homes and uh, nursing homes and things like that. Okay. Um, a couple of other things. We can get you the statute number on the confidentiality provision. And I, I don't know what they're doing about com preventing fraud and cybersecurity issues, but I know they're doing things. And there's also a technology fellow that was um, funded by a group of funders to also look at cybersecurity and, and be supportive around that. Okay. When will the when when do you think the uh, Vicky you think the the actual form will be available? Because my guess is for for um, in some of our communities, um, if we're doing outreach, it would probably be useful for us to be able to show people the actual form so they uh, so they can get a little bit more familiarity with it. Um, both uh, the online form and the uh, and the hard copy form. So I was wondering when, I, and obviously you can't do the form until you have the final decision from the Supreme Court. But is there are there target dates at this point? I do not know that either, but I can get you the information. And and they they will be posted. Like a sample version will be online, and there will be copies of it. But I can. I can see if we can target down a time frame for that. Okay. Yeah, I think for in terms of our outreach, uh, I'm uh, my my guess is our folks are going to want to want to establish some time frames over the course of uh, of of the next school year, um, and that information would probably be factored into uh, their time frames as well. So that would be that would be helpful. Yes. On that note, Jeff, let me add that the, I'm working with the, um, some of Vicki's coll colleagues to put together a webinar on the timelines and the materials that will be available from the census. I would expect that webinar to be late June or early July, and uh, I can get that information to you when it's scheduled, Jeff, and then people can join it, or you can do it and then do a write-up for your, your school so that they can plan around it. Right. Um, I think we, we talked a little bit about it earlier, but there was an, uh, an additional question about, um, about what languages will the, the Census Bureau's promotional materials be translated in. Um, and I, I think that's, uh, that's a question of since many of our districts have, you know, literally um, in some instances hundreds of languages, we may have to do some translations uh, ourselves. So, uh, but uh, I think I, I heard um, um, Spanish, but I'm not sure if any of the other major languages you, the materials will be uh, available in. So for promotional materials or for statistics in schools materials? Promotional materials the was the question. Okay, so we have 12 main languages that um, Deb referred to that, that a majority of the materials, the, the call center will be open in. We will have take-home letters for families available in those 12 languages. I know it includes like Chinese and Korean. I can look it up for you. But um, those are the 12 main languages that, the, that I will get for you <laughs> that the Census Bureau is translating the materials in. Okay. I think also that there's an additional 59 languages online where they have a guide to filling out the form. So the form isn't in those languages, but then there's a guide that translates it if you go online and read the guide. Right. Um, and Vicki, we can check that, but I'm pretty sure that's right, that beyond the 12 languages they're actually producing materials in, there's an online guide to more. Yes. I think we've gone through all of our questions. Um, anything else that you all uh, uh, want to mention before we wrap up here? Um, 
Vicki, you go first. I do have one thing. Uh, I guess, and this is more open-ended and we don't have to do it now, but I was just wanting to make sure that, that we're targeting the right audience and, and are there any suggestions for who we need to work with to, to help get these materials used in the school? Is this the right forum? Should we be focusing on the teachers? Who, who in your systems are the right people to work with? But it's more open-ended, so <laughs> we can follow up on that later. Okay, and yeah, we'll try to identify that at that as well. So the thing that I wanted to encourage everyone to do is if you go to the Count All Kids website, you can sign up for the Count All Kids campaign materials, and that is where when we've completed our message research and we've developed um, research, you know, outreach materials like posters and flyers that. Um, are designed specifically with messages that will reach families with young children, we'll send that out on that listserv. We don't use it very often, maybe once a month. Um, but if you go to countallkids.org, you can sign up for the campaign, and then you'll get all the materials as they're available. So I encourage you to do that. Um, you can also, if you want to like know more of what's going on in between, go to our Facebook page for Count All Kids or follow us on Twitter. But to be sure you get all the materials we're producing, I encourage you to go to countallkids.org and sign up for the campaign. Okay. Um, well, again, uh, we want to express uh, our appreciation here at the Great City Schools to uh, both Deb and Vicki for taking the time and, uh, and putting together this webinar. And we will stay in touch and, uh, and try to be a conduit uh, between uh, both the uh, Count All Kids uh, uh, campaign and uh, the Census Bureau uh, and our school district. So uh, again, thank you guys very much. Uh, it is so much appreciated. Thank you for inviting you. us to offer this webinar. Have a good day, everybody. Have a All good righty, day. take care. Yeah. Bye. I'm going to stop the recording now. Bye-bye.